Welcome. Thank you for joining us at Build Peace 2015. We are incredibly excited to welcome you here in Nicosia. Um, as some of you know, uh, we started this conference last year. Uh, we were hosted very kindly at MIT in Boston. Um, and we are very happy to be hosted by the United Nations Development Program here in Cyprus this year. I'm not going to talk much about UNDP because uh, Christopher Louise, the program manager of UNDP in Cyprus, will be joining us in a second to give some introductory remarks as well. Um, I do want to tell you one thing about Cyprus, which is that I've been working in Cyprus with the UNDP um, uh, for a few years, helping out on a few projects. And one of the things that I've learned being here is that the nature of the word peace is quite contested in Cyprus. And actually, that's not something that is unique to Cyprus. In many of the contexts that a lot of us work in, the word peace is contested. Actually, in conversations with people here in Cyprus, I ended up writing a blog post that was called, Peace is not a dirty word. Why is it that we shy away from that word sometimes? Why do some people not like to use it in certain contexts? And I want to tell you a little story of why, oh, that works better. <laughs> I didn't realize that was happening. Um, I want to tell you a little story about um, why I think that the word peace is sometimes contested. Uh, some of you might know that I'm from Spain. And in Spain, we had, a, we had a dictatorship, a fascist dictatorship from 1939 until 1976. And in 1964, uh, Franco, who was the dictator, celebrated 25 years in power. And he celebrated it with the slogan, 25 years of peace. Now, of course, to a lot of people, that did not feel like peace. Um, and so the counter slogan from many activists, including my parents, was this. We don't want the peace of the graveyards. And I think this is why sometimes people have a problem with the word peace, because peace can mean the peace of the graveyards, and that's not what we want it to mean, right? When we talk about building peace, we have to ask ourselves, who decides what that means? Peace by whom and for whom? And that's the tagline of our conference this year, peace through technology, by whom and for whom? Whose behavior are we changing? Who is being empowered to do what? And what, who decides what constitutes impact in this space? Now, you may initially ask, what do these questions have to do with technology? I mean, OK, they have to do with peace, but what do they have to do with technology? Um, BuildUp is uh, the very small organization that um, is organizing this conference with the support of an incredible group of volunteers about whom I will talk later and with the great support of UNDP in Cyprus. Um, and at BuildUp, uh, we, um, we work at the intersection of peace building, technology, and civic engagement. And the provocation we put forward with our work is that we think we need to reinterpret peace building as civic engagement. And not only that we need to reinterpret peace building as civic engagement, but that technology plays a key role in that reinterpretation. That the key thing that technology does is broaden participation in peace building processes, so that really what they are are civic engagement processes that deal with conflict. So with that in mind, this year um, we're talking about three key questions to try to unpack that concept. Um, and the first one is um, question, a question around behavior change. Um, and specifically, whose behavior are we changing when we use technology to build peace? Um, during the preparations for this conference, uh, many of you, particularly those of you who are speaking, heard from Jen, who's standing over here. I'll introduce her properly later. Jen is another one of the organizers. And in one of those conversations, we had Jen um, and Mark Nelson from the Sanford Peace Innovation Lab um, and Samir Doshi from uh, US, the US Global Development Lab. And they were having a conversation. Um, and they were talking um, about uh, the, the, the panel on behavior change that they will be uh, on later. Um, and at one point in that conversation, Samir said to Mark, yes, but peace by whom and for whom? Who is it, that, whose behavior are we changing? And Jen said, you know, this is exactly the kind of questions that we want to ask at this, at this, uh, at this conference. Um, and in fact, there are many different ways in which this, uh, this kind of question can be uh, explored. Um, there's, a, you know, there's the kind of panel and discussion way, 
maybe another way to explore whose behavior are we changing um, is to explore our own relationship with conflict through creative expression. And if that is something that you're interested in, I recommend that you check out many of the uh, artworks that are being showcased in our arts program, and particularly uh, Jason Meeks and Rosalind de Thelen's community performance this evening, which will be really driving some of these inquiries as well. Okay, so one question is behavior change. Another question is empowerment. And particularly, who is being empowered to do what by technology to build peace? Um, this is a question that uh, Sanjana Hatatua from the ICT for Peace Foundation, who's also somewhere here, um, asked last year at Build Peace 2014, um, very persistently over Twitter, um, he kept asking who is being empowered in these projects that we are seeing showcased. Sanjana has been a great friend of this conference and, and we really took up that inquiry that he put out and we thought this is something that does deserve a lot more thought. Um, and, uh, and in fact, you'll be hearing from a number of speakers that deal with this issue of empowerment. Um, one uh, is uh, the first keynote uh, by Socrates and Esra, who are also sitting somewhere here, um, on Imagine Fama Gusta, uh, which is a project that, um, that uses a technology platform to try to define the future of our divided city. Um, and you'll hear more about what that project is, but I really, I think it's a very interesting way of looking at empowerment as well. And I think the question of empowerment, um, what it also asks us to do is to think about our privilege, to be aware of the privilege that we have um, in having access to the tools that we have access to, uh, and even in being able to, to be in this room together and to be at this conference. Um, there are a number of participants who weren't able to make it because they couldn't get their visas on time. For many of us, that is not an issue at all. There are a number of participants who couldn't make it from Yemen because they weren't able to leave the country. That also is our privilege because we're able to move um, fr freely. And with that privilege comes the responsibility, the responsibility of bringing those that cannot be here at this conference or that cannot be part of a peace building process into the dialogue. So that's empowerment. And then the last question we are going to be asking throughout this conference um, is a question around impact and specifically who decides what constitutes impact in a peace building setting? Um, and at what cost do we think peace comes? Um, there's a quote by uh, Daniel Berrigan, who's a, a poet, a priest, and a, and a peace activist that I particularly like in this respect. And he says, of course, let us have the peace, we cry. But at the same time, let us have normalcy. Let us lose nothing, that our lives stand intact. Let us no, know neither prison, nor ill repute, nor disruption of ties. I really like that because it reminds us of the fact that building peace sometimes can have very high costs. And you will be hearing um, a keynote that we're very excited about from Dalia Hajomer, who is a Sudanese activist who will be talking um, about the very real cost of activism in a place like Sudan. If you're more interested in uh, measuring impact by the numbers and getting into the analytics of measuring the impact of projects that try to build peace, um, I would strongly recommend that you, uh, that you uh, head over to the working session on peace data analysis, which has been uh, chaired and organized by the Data Pop Alliance, another good friend of the conference. That will be on Sunday morning. Now you may have realized by now that there's no way I'm going to read out the whole program. That's why you have a book to check the program in. Um, we are equally delighted about all of the content in that program. The ones I'm calling out are just the few that have stuck with me as I was making these slides. Um, so, keeping the peace is not the only goal of peace building, right? This is what we were saying earlier with this quote about we don't just want the peace of the graveyards. Keeping the peace sometimes may be to challenge what otherwise remains an unquestioned status quo, or a dominant power structure, or a single story as history, or a majority's perspective as the only truth. And technology can play a role in this because it can enable a multiplicity of voices organizing in different ways to build us all not one piece, but many different kinds of peace. And that's great, but, and there is a big but, Technology can also enable a small elite to define what peace should mean to all of us.
peace building is, is not value free because mean, peace can mean many different things, as we were saying earlier. But te and technologies may be value neutral, but the way that we use them is not. And so in a way, the key message that we think is beginning to come out from this community is that it's up to us. It's up to the processes we create around new technologies to make sure that we are working in ways that engage a broad base to define what piece is being built. The question I usually ask is, or I was asking up until now, is what kind of alternative infrastructures for peace do we want to build through technology? Alternative infrastructures for peace. And then one day, um, Amy Nurel, I may be mispronouncing her name, but she is at USAID OTI and another very good friend of this conference, said, okay, well that's great that you keep asking about alternative infrastructures for peace, but how do those infrastructures complement existing infrastructures for peace? And she has encouraged us to ask a question that I also think will come up in this conference, which is how can grassroots alternative infrastructures complement existing longer term infrastructures? How do those things come together? And it starts here. All of these things, how we choose to use technologies, how we choose to build peace, how we choose to define peace, begins with how we come together in this conference. Um, some of you may remember that last year we said, let's encourage everybody to be tough on ideas, but gentle on people. This year, we would like you to still remember that, but we would also encourage you to be careful with each other so that you can be dangerous together. That's all I had to say on substantive things. And now I'm gonna put my conference organizer hat back on after having gotten excited about technology and peace and do some housekeeping. So, that's our Twitter hashtag. That's our Twitter handle. If you are tweeting, please use some combination of those two. You should all have the Wi-Fi password by now. If you don't, it's build peace. Um, we have a live stream up. It's stream.howtobuildpeace.org. We would encourage you to share it um, with other people who haven't been able to made it, make it. Um, we also have um, a, an open interactive consultation channel through an app called AppGree. If you go to appgree.howtobuildpeace.org, you can sign up to that. We are running um, a consultation throughout the conference on behalf of our partner, Peace Nexus, um, to provide some ideas on what they should focus their innovation calls on. So make sure you get on that app and provide your ideas. We will also be doing um, a live uh, reporting back on how the conference is going. So if you want to tell us what we're doing well or not doing so well, get on that app. We'll be sending out questions and you can, ask, you can answer them in real time. Um, hopefully you all have programs in your bags. If you don't, tell us and we'll get you one. Um, the maps are terrible. I designed them so I can say that. Um, we, Jen spent a long time designing a beautiful uh, interactive map that is on the website that I strongly recommend you use. The print maps didn't go so well, so sorry about that. Um, and. Uh, there's one mistake, well, there's one change in the program, um, which is the tech fair venue is advertised as Poncha. It is no longer in Poncha, it's now right here. So it's even closer, you can't miss it. Um, come by at coffee or at lunch. Um, there will be um, a, non, uh, a peaceful anti-nuclear concert starting at 2 p.m. on the other side of the mosque. That's not part of the conference, but it's kind of awesome that it's happening at the same time. You may hear a bit of the background music. We don't think it's going to carry too much. And by all means, you can wander over and check it out. Um, there is a bathroom. There, there's a bathroom right outside here. There's a sign if you just go out into the courtyard. There are more bathrooms if you go out of this door and you turn right and follow the signs at a venue called Sabor, which is also where you will be having lunch. Um, there is first aid available should anyone need it over here at the front next to the AV desk. And I think that's everything. Have I missed anything? No? Okay. Good? Okay. So. 
that was my housekeeping. And now, um, just to close off, um, I wanted to do a very quick round of thank yous. Um, my first thank you um, goes out to all the people who are wearing black badges and or a yellow t-shirt. Those are the Bill Peace volunteers. They are offering their time up uh, to guide you around, uh, to make sure that we have enough plugs, just to make sure everything is working. So a very big thank you to them. Also a big thank you to um, the artists that have joined us this year. This, is, um, this year is our inaugural um, year for an arts program. We're very excited to have them here. Um, and uh, please do visit them. The venues where you can see their artworks are in the program. So a big round of applause for our artists, please. Um, and then I just um, actually want to call out by name um, the Build Peace organizing team. Um, this conference is an all-volunteer organized conference, so all of the organizers are also volunteers, and they are, I'm gonna ask them to wave if they're around. Uh, Rodrigo, Michaela, who's at the back, Jen, Jacob, who is setting up art for you, um, Elada, who is also setting up art for you, Kate, who is over there, uh, Natalie, who is over there, and Julie, I'm not sure where she is, but she's around. She's probably guiding people around, at the door. Um, and, uh, and finally, Ariel, who is not here with us, but has been doing a lot of communications work behind the, behind the um, yeah, in the preparation phase. Uh, and then finally, this conference wouldn't be happening without the very generous support of our sponsors. Um, you uh, can see who they are on the back of your program. They're also on this slide. So a very big thank you to Peace Nexus, to the ICT for Peace Foundation, to New Markets Advisors, to the US Institute for Peace and the Peace Tech Lab, to the Alliance for Peace Building, and to the European Institute of Peace. Really, this wouldn't be happening without them. So please, a big round of applause for them. Um, I think it's very special that we're here in this, uh, in this very particular city. Um, it was a de deliberate choice um, on our behalf to bring you to a context like this, to have this conversation. Um, we think it's very relevant to the conference topics, as I'm sure you'll experience, um, and we're, we're pretty sure that it's going to enrich the conversations to be in this city. Um, and, uh, and we have UNDP to thank for that. Um, and there are, also, there are also a few specific people in UNDP that I would like to thank. Um, I'm not sure where they're sitting, but they are Denny, George, Nilgan, Marina, Maria, and Joe. If you see any of those people, they also have badges. You can give them a big thank you because they have been doing a lot of on-the-ground work to make sure that these venues are available, to make sure that we have t-shirts and lanyards and name tags and all those necessary things. Um, and finally, a very big thank you to Christopher Louise who is the, uh, the program manager for UNDP here in Cyprus, um, and he will be giving some introductory remarks now. We wouldn't be here without their help. Thank you.